Greetings, salutations, and welcome to the Krieger Cast. I'm joined once again by Christopher Gillen. It still cracks me up. <laughs> I'm never going to get used to that. Oh, man. So, uh, today's topic actually is one that's mildly near and dear to our hearts. Uh, mildly? Mildly, mildly. I mean, I think a little bit more so to you than myself. That might be true. What are we talking about? Star Wars. Ooh, the Star War. Yes, we're going to be talking about the Star War. The one war. So there I weren't two of them. There were not two of them. So let's start from the beginning. How were you first exposed to Star Wars? Um, I, like you, I believe were part of the uh, the marketing demographic for the prequels. Yes. Um, yes. We were seven years old when episode one came out um and i don't remember ever having seen any of the original trilogy movies before that it's okay. it's possible that, that i have but to be honest with you i've watched them so many times that they don't really stand out um as like when you first saw them. right yeah there's it's just not a part of you. right i'm just always known star wars i've always seen star wars and i i mean literally hundreds of rewatches of every movie um so it doesn't really stand out to me but i'm sure it was around that time i mean i was seven it was probably around the time that i started being aware of the world around me and started being able to comprehend films that weren't um the lion king and you know the animated disney films that were super popular in the 90s when we were growing up so um yeah my guess is what that it would be around the time when the prequels came out just because that they started marketing it again so you think you might have seen episode one first definitely not okay i can say without a doubt that i saw all of the the original trilogy first the original trilogy. yeah we're not calling it that um <laughs> yeah without a doubt i saw the original trilogy first um i just think that it was probably around that time when the prequels were coming out so for me i'm i'm pretty certain i saw it uh, a lot earlier um i remember distinctly watching jurassic park first okay and another, um, another fantastic movie series that we should also do a podcast about we will be doing a podcast about jurassic park great but uh, the reason it's relevant here is it scared the hell out of me as a little kid. Yeah. Uh, reoccurring nightmares of uh, velociraptors attacking me. Oh, sure. I hid under the blankets the first time I saw Jurassic Park. I remember very vividly the first time I saw Jurassic Park. Yeah, it was intense. But the reason I bring that up is because it was Jurassic Park that caused me to watch the original trilogy. My parents wanted to introduce me to other films that were spectacles that were not as frightening. Uh, to kind of get me over that. So uh, we pulled out, uh, you know, Star Wars on Laserdisc. Jesus. And uh, watched the original trilogy as George Lucas originally intended it. Sure. Um, I mean, I saw them on VHS. So okay. that was, you know, before the DVD remasters when they added all the they added BS. stuff on the they added stuff both on laser discs and on vhs oh really yeah a uh, little things at first you know the changes between certain sounds and whatnot sure um the C the additional cgi was not till yeah, later not till the dvd remasters yeah ash doesn't like that <laughs> he doesn't you know he really should have been here for today <laughs> yeah he's got a baby Sorry, Ash. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Probably busy with that, I think. Um, yeah. I, Star Wars, man. The original, the Ridge Tridge, uh, was solidified in my head before I saw the advertising for um, Episode 1. And I remember going into Episode 1 with no hype whatsoever. I don't know why, but whatever it was about the marketing campaign did not get me excited about it at all. Man, I don't I don't remember the marketing 
of it at all. I don't remember trailers of it. I don't even remember seeing it for the first time. Like, that's what I'm saying about, like, I've watched these so many times that no per- no particular watch stands out to me. I, I can't remember at all seeing those movies. Gosh, I actually distinctly remember going into the theater and watching it. And thinking it was pretty decent uh, at the time. I mean, it was a little kid. I didn't care for Jar Jar Binks, but I didn't hate him either. Um... I did not think uh, Darth Maul was as cool as he everyone else thought he was. And I do remember as a kid going, why did they introduce this guy to do nothing with him? Like, I, I distinctly remember that part. But what I adored was the design of the droids. I really loved the Trade Federation droids. Yeah. Particularly as a kid, I thought they were really cool. Uh, you, you and I quote the droids from episode one quite a lot to each other while doing yes. other things particularly playing star wars themed video games this is you and i cool. call roger roger all the time to each other yeah um, <laughs> well the the uh the prequel the pre-tridge no, no. stop okay um the prequels are so incredibly quotable Oh, well, yeah, because they're modern movies. This is true, but can you name a quote from the newer Star Wars films? I can only think of one off the top of my head. By newer, you mean like Last Jedi or Force Awakens or... Yeah, any of the uh, the post-Lucas Star Wars. Sure. Um, yeah, only one from Force Awakens. Okay. Um, when, when Rey and... Finn are running to the quad jumper and it gets blowed up and then um the line before it, that happens ray says something like um that one's a hunk of junk and then the the quad jumper gets blown up and then she says the junk will do and then it's the millennium falcon true um, have you used the junk will do in conversation no of course not the- but here's the thing is that i didn't particularly like the Force we'll, Awakens. We'll talk about that We'll get later. there. But, uh, yeah, I only quote movies that I like or TV shows that I like. Um, obviously, I wouldn't quote things that I don't like that much. So, um, hmm. it's not as eminently quotable. I just think that um, the movie scene at the time, the movie um, Hollywood at the time was... Um, those were sort of really big deals. It was like one-liners in movies. It, not that it... Not like I the mean, 80s. Not it, like the 80s at all. Right. I mean, it, one-liners in movies have always been popular. Like, if you ever watch any of those, like, AFI, like, yeah. top 100 movie quotes of all time, like, um, the one from Gone with the Wind is always yeah. number one, and that movie was made in, like, the 40s or something like that. Uh, so, like, obviously... Um, 1939. Was it? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The only reason I think, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was either 38 or 39, was uh, there's a copy of the script in the Tomb of Humanity, or Crypt of Humanity, Mm. which was done then. Sure. Uh, Anyway, so like, um, one-liners in movies have always been a thing, but specifically in like the 90s and early 2000s, you were coming fresh off the, um, like the 80s one-liners as comedic relief type of thing and that's what were used in the star wars films particularly episode one that's the thing though is that most of the quotes we quote are totally not meant to be quoted um try spinning that's a good trick right have the high ground right well those uh, those have become memes at this point like those i just like at the time they were watching the movies like yes those aren't meant to be like one-off like one-liners that are funny but there certainly are those quotes in the movies that are definitely meant to be funny almost every line that comes out of Jar Jar Pink's mouth is supposed to be comedic relief yes but how um, quotable is Jar Jar I, mean, I think Jar Jar's incredibly qu- quotable it's just that nobody can do that voice and everybody hates Jar Jar <laughs> I do know quite a few by quite a few I mean two um, people who do like to use Misa thinks. Yeah. But Or um, like Big Boss Nass, like they like all of his lines are pretty funny. Yusa think a Yusa greater than the Gungans. <laughs> like that's so well, good. And the Planet Core line. Yeah. But um in the new films, in the um Disney acquired films, 
The only lines I can think of that have had any real merit or impact on me are both from Rogue One, and one of them didn't even make it into the movie, which is, of course, I Rebel. Sure. Which didn't make it into yeah. the film. Which totally should have been in the film. Although, you know what? I've got to say that out of the now four movies that yeah. have come out in this iteration of the Star Wars universe, universe I liked Rogue One the best. Uh, likewise. It's the only one that I would consider on the... like. If I were to tell people what is Star Wars, I would say the original trilogy, Rogue plus, One. Plus Rogue One. And maybe if you can stomach it, the um, the prequels. And I don't say that like the prequels are awful, which a lot of people think they are, and they're not particularly fun movies. But I don't think the prequels hurt Star Wars at all. Like, there has to be, you know, a prequel and... I don't think they did a bad job at being a prequel. Right. I think a lot of that has come later, uh, like, since those movies came out. At the time, I don't remember anybody having a, any particular problem with them. And maybe Everyone they did. Everyone was excited for them. Maybe the they movie. did, and I was just too young to, like, sort of have my finger on the pulse of maybe, you know, the, the internet's reaction. The internet was kind of young then too and i wasn't on it so i don't know but um but there was a lot of time between the films i i would have considered myself like fully functional by the time of the third film sure um yeah and i don't remember there being like a, a particular lot of outrage i feel like a lot of that came later i was here um i always find myself defending the prequels a lot because i hear people particularly who are People who call themselves so Star Wars fans say George Luc George Lucas ruins Star Wars. Oh, I thought you were going to go another way with that. No, uh, George Lucas ruins Star Wars. This is a thing that I hear a lot, and I think that's really funny just because of the idea that these fanboys um, think they know so much about this universe that they think they know better than the man who literally created it from scratch. And George Lucas made the prequels and was heavily involved in the prequels. Therefore, that's what Star Wars is. And if you don't like them, maybe you're not as much of a Star Wars fan as you think you are. And I mean, it is like poetry. It does rhyme. God. Mm. So bad. Okay. Um, so bad. On the subject of uh, St. George Lucas, uh, <laughs> know, knowing, knowing about the prequels... Uh, what color is Yoda's blood? This is like a trivia question. Not only is it a trivia question, but it's kind of a famous behind the scenes, like, scene where someone comes up to George Lucas and says, what color is Yoda's blood? Because, you know, like, we're going to be doing this modeling and stuff like that. We need to know. And Tr trick question, Yoda doesn't bleed. But, uh, George Lucas responds befuddled. Uh, uh I don't know, green? <laughs> and it, it's really great um <laughs> that's a pretty terrible answer the uh that's pretty funny the red letter media guys love to point that out because it shows that he didn't think like everything through in the minutest detail i'm sure he had the plot you know that he wanted and of course I'm, he did he's telling the story he's not supposed to be making this he george lucas didn't make the extended universe the fans made the extended universe. But that's what I think is funny about all these people getting all uppity. Like now that Disney owns Lucasfilm and yeah. owns all the rights to Star Wars, and they basically declared the entirety of the extended universe not canon, and all these people are getting upset. I'm like, why? Why does that make you upset? It's canon to you. Just enjoy the thing that was made. So does that mean that Darth Vader's suit is no longer a polished voodoo hide? Yes. Oh. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> um... In case you can't tell, I am a large fan of Red Letter Media, and I do love their Star Wars content. Oh, God. Oh, so actually, I'll pose the question, the uh, famous Plinket question to you. Um, describe the main characters from the prequels without describing their job or appearance. Okay. So let's start Qui-Gon Jinn. <laughs> Fun fact, can't do it. Okay. Yep. Uh, Padme. Um, Natalie Portman. Okay. Does that, does that too, touch too close to the appearance thing? Sexy as all hell. So now let's go to the arranged Tridge. Okay. Um, Han Solo. 
Um, um, bad boy. Okay. Yeah. Scruffy um, looking nerf herder. <laughs> that's what I was hoping you'd say. <laughs> that's that's uh, too close to appearance. It is, it Who's is. Who's scruffy looking? Okay, uh, what about Luke Skywalker? King Arthur. Obi-Wan Kenobi? Uh, Merlin. Well, okay, yes. In- interesting responses, by the way. I've not heard those before. But the point is that there's... It's a little easier to describe the characters from the original Tridge than the prequels. Um, other than just saying, well, I mean, he's, he's a Jedi. The reason for that is because that Star Wars, the first one, the one that we call A New Hope and or Episode Four, but was just Star Wars back then is King Arthur. I mean, it's yeah, the story it's... of King Arthur. It's the sword and the stone. Those characters already existed, and George Lucas wasn't making that from scratch, which he did with the prequels. But here's the thing about the prequels, is you have to have seen the original trilogy to really get it. I mean, to get all the references sure. that they're making. Like, like when they introduce Obi-Wan Kenobi in literally the first scene of the movie... You're, the camera focuses on him. There's a music thing that's like, they very clearly say his name. You're supposed to associate Ewan McGregor with Alec Guinness. Yeah. Sir Alec Guinness. Um, like, th- it relied so heavily on um, on you having the previous knowledge of the original trilogy, which wasn't an original story. It was the story of King Arthur. And George Lucas just built on it. That's fine. Um but I think that's like the characters are maybe a little less three dimensional because of that. But I do think there are a lot of really good characters in the prequels that that were, um, that were interesting. Maybe not necessarily like uh, like characters that could carry a movie or like really add yeah. to a movie. But, but like you kind of cared you cared about them, right? Like you, Padme, and, right? And look at the fan base that developed around Darth Maul, who did nothing. Right. All Darth less. Maul did was lose two. St- two fights though there's an actual really cool uh dissection of the duel of the fates uh where they talk about how it pure body language how darth maul comes off as uh so very stereotypically sif how he paces and doesn't wait while you know obi-wan and qui-gon you know have different reactions to the same situation qui-gon being stoic and um and then Obi-Wan kind of being halfway in between you know, right. chaos and control. I think Darth Maul is a really interesting villain. One, because he looked so cool. And so different. Seven-year-old me was just like, oh my god, this guy is great. The red and the black. And when he finally lowers his head for the first time, or his hood for the first time, and you see the horns and the, what they did with the teeth. And then... Um, the dual-sided lightsaber, which we'd never seen before in the films. Which started a trend. Right, which was amazing. It was just so... He was such a cool villain. He wasn't a good villain in the sense of, like, uh, he didn't really add anything to the story. You know, he wasn't... He obviously wasn't... Uh, he wasn't the Dark Lord of the Sith who was pulling strings behind the scenes and, and doing all this stuff. True. He was kind of just there as uh, the military arm of the Sith, but he looked so cool. But he was also the pawn of the person pulling sure. the strings, which allowed that to be introduced. Right. But yeah, I mean, there weren't a lot of characters, I don't think, in the prequels that had, like, uh, that had three-dimensionality that were, like... Within the context of the films, no, but if you do go into the expanded universe of sure. uh, the Clone Wars, Grievous has a lot more going on. A lot of the clones have more going on. Right. You know. Um... Anakin yeah, definitely, well. like, uh, the Clone Wars animated series really flushed out, like, uh, even characters that, like, just only get screen time and don't have any, um, don't have any, like, speaking lines, like Plo Koon, who is, yeah. like, one of the main characters. Um, There's a lot of those, like, in, the head of the Techno or, Union. Yeah, Ayla Sakura, um, Kiati Mundi, stuff like that, who, like, characters who are, like, barely on screen at all in the cinematic representations of the universe, but um, get a lot more screen time. A lot more FaceTime in the extended universe. I think that's cool. I don't Commander, think they... C- Commander Cody. Indeed. Um, I don't think the stuff. the Techno Union guy doesn't get a backstory. I don't think. I don't know if he gets. He's definitely in the in the Clone Wars. Is though. He? Like he, yeah, he's got. I don't know if there's like a backstory so much, but he's he's in it at least. I just still adore the Techno Union meme. 
Which one? The, the just the one where when he messes with the dial, uh, yeah, different techno change, music, different techno yeah. music plays. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But um, so back to quotable lines. Sure. Um, now and... this is pod racing. Okay, <laughs> wait, I have to get to that. So uh, actually, this is really funny about. So I enjoy the prequels. I've always thought that the pod racing scene is one of the best scenes in the Star Wars universe. I think that whole scene is so freaking exciting because when they when they say pod racing, you're like, okay, like, what does that even mean? You have literally no clue what that could possibly mean. And then they show this thing, this scene, and it's amazing. And I literally Sunday morning, I watched that scene with my dad. This Sunday? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Just that scene. Just that scene. It was on TV. Happened to be on TV on Sunday morning. And my dad and I watched it together. With the volume all the way up. You know, big screen TV. Because we both enjoy it so much. It was so different. And it was just it was just incredible. It was just this amazing scene. And there's n- almost no dialogue except for like the... Uh, like the announcers who are like the CGI two-headed thing, yeah. just saying like, um, this person takes the lead or this person's catching up or whatever. And then like, uh, uh, there's like one or two lines that that you know, Liam Neeson and Natalie Portman have. They're like, here he comes or where is he or something like that. That like don't add actually add anything to the scene. I don't think they take anything away from the scene, but um, they're like just. To remind you that those people are there and have an interest in the outcome of the race. But I just think that scene is amazing. And it does really set up that Anakin's special. Right. So. Yeah, it does. It, it, yeah, I mean, it, it was important in the sense of, like, the, his, his pod racer is spinning out of control and he just, like, calmly flitch, flips some switches and then reattaches the thing with a magnet and then, you know. Yeah. He's just, like, all while, uh... You know, hurtling along the ground at however, whatever Ridiculous speed, speed, whatever speed pod racers go. And like the, the thing in the caves when they're like doing the thing and like that's, you know, obviously the, like they specifically make mention of that being difficult because there's a line before the race that's Anakin's like, I'm the only human that can do it. Like it's just setting him up as this, this the uh, chosen one. Yeah, right. He was this, the chosen one. Right. This incredible individual. Uh, I do think the prequels, though, are infinitely quotable. But, back to Rogue One. Okay. There is, I rebel. And then, of course, there is the other line from the commercial. Um, you are being rescued. Please do not resist. Yeah. Um, That's a good one, too. That one, I think, has the possibility of being used out of context. Sure. Um, I could see people saying that to, like, someone at a party and saying, like, let's go. You yeah. know, that sort of thing. Wasn't that a, wasn't that a line in, like, I, Robot? I feel like there's a scene in iRobot where so, a robot says a similar that's line. That's very possible. And on a side tangent, iRobot once came available in HD VHS. But that's another show. <laughs> um, so, that's possible. But remember K2SO? Sure. The Imperial droid that got uh, brainwashed to work for his enemies. Yeah. Um does uh reminisce a little bit about like or has a an appearance similar to irobot not in color or anything like that but just in the general feel and the way he moves is really similar to the irobot robots yeah that is true um that might be the connection might be a mandela effect (laughs) it's not a thing do you, do you know much about the Mandela Effect? Not at all. This is going to be so off topic. Oh my yeah, God. yeah it's, it's perfectly fine. I was just, <laughs> you know, I was, I was driving along with Chris tonight. We were giving some dinner. We were watching some Review Bra. Third time's the charm. See? Yeah. Um, we were watching... Now he's going to appear like Beetlejuice. <laughs> <laughs> so we were watching some Review Bra and Review Bra's episode on IHOB. And he was talking about the Mandela effect, and Chris implied that he didn't know about it, which I refuse to believe. Because it's not a thing. No, it's not a thing. I agree with that. Yeah. But you do know about the, like, internet conspiracy theory about it. No. That Mandela died in prison? He didn't. Okay. So you're from this barren stain universe, aren't you? (laughs) 
He was elected president of South Africa and ended apartheid. Like, why can't we leave it at that? He did a nice thing for humanity. Well, anyway. Um, he kicked all the white people out of South Africa. South Africa. And they, yes. won a, they won a Rugby World Cup. It's a nice story. Let's just leave it alone. Please, internet, stop ruining things. Yeah. Didn't he once live in Massachusetts? I don't know. I think he did. I don't know anything about Nelson Mandela, except that he was in prison. Then he was in a movie with Matt Damon. and He was in a movie with Matt Damon? That was the joke. He's played by Morgan Freeman. Oh. In Invictus, the movie with Matt Damon. It's about rugby. But it's not about rugby. It's about a nice human story. People coming together in racist times and not being racist. They, Please, internet, let us have this one. They live in harmony and racism. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, oh, you were right. That that did go way Yeah, the deep I told you. Stop it. Let's rank Star Wars films in Ooh. order. Okay. That's an idea I had. Okay, and I am going to be hated. Are we going to go... Let's go from worst to best. All right. right. I can do that. So, your worst one. The Last Jedi. I agree. Okay. (laughs) You want to say why? Oh, so instead of just doing the list, we'll talk about why? Well, since we agree, we should talk about why we both feel that's the worst one. Okay. Uh, The reason I don't like it, and this is going to be key, is... And it should be an argument that I could use against um, The Force Awakens. But the problem with The Force Awakens is I mildly liked it. So I can't use this argument against it. Which is, I think Disney should have just dropped all the old characters and started doing their own thing. Because then you can kind of headcanon your way around it. You know, it's kind of like the way they did the new Star Trek films. You know, it's a different universe, so you can enjoy it for what it is. But Disney shoved down our throats. These are the people you love. These are the stories you cared about. And they're gone. And they're ruined. So I almost have to write off everything Disney is non-canon. You know, only what was controlled by St. George Lucas is (laughs) is canon. And everything else is hypocritical. I'll touch on a more specific example of that exact idea in the films. Um... Obviously, um, the late, great, um... George Lucas. <laughs> no. <laughs> the late, great Carrie Fisher <laughs> died, um, during production. Um, I don't know if it was during filming. I don't know if they were already done with principal photography by the Pretty time she died. They, they probably were, and the film was in post, um... But there's a scene where Leia almost dies, and then they bring her back, and I felt that was really campy. They were, like, really trying to force on everybody that Leia was a force adept. And, I like, anybody who's a fan of Star Wars knows that she is. I mean, like, that's a thing that's been yeah. established for a really long time, extended universe or not. I mean, I mean, even in, even in the original trilogy, there's a thing where, like... Leia clearly has a sense of where Luke is or how Luke is doing. Yep. There's there there's a very there's some very explicit scenes where that is established. Um, but it, that was a point where I was like, okay, Carrie Carrie Fisher died. Um, let's use that and maybe go in a different direction. Like yeah. let's let her die. I mean, that's what they did in Force Awakens. They killed off Han Solo. Mostly because Harrison Fisher has been begging to be... Harrison Fisher. Harrison that was Ford. A great, yeah. Harrison Ford has been begging George Lucas to be killed off for like 30 years. He wanted this is to, true. He wanted to die in Return of the Jedi. He wanted his character yeah. to die in Return of the Jedi to make it more gritty or make it, um, you know, not a happy ending. Which I think is a great idea. Um, I like the way that Return of the Jedi ended, obviously. Um, I like my science fantasy happy. Sure. Uh... I also like it gritty, but make it gritty the whole time. Don't make it a happy and gritty, I guess. Anyway, we'll get to that. The point is, um, I felt like you could have used that scene that you'd already filmed to kill off Carrie Fisher. Took take you could have the movie. She was unnecessary for the rest of the film. Right, the movie the movie would have been the exact same if you hadn't had her in it. Um, 
she just wasn't necessary at all because that's literally what they did they put her in a coma for the entire rest of the movie until like the very last yeah. scene it was, she was totally unnecessary didn't need to be there at all the other thing that really ruined the last jedi for me and i told you this in the parking lot at the movie theater after immediately after we saw it yes together we on, went and saw it on not opening night but maybe the next day or the day it was after within the first week yeah. yeah um i told you this in the parking lot um i hate what they did to luke skywalker Yes. I hated the sarcastic one-liners, the glib comments, just the whole attitude, the, the thing where he, after, uh, you know, he's the, the force projection and the whole first order, everybody shoots him and then he just brushes it. I hated that. But you got to admit that Mark Hamill did a fantastic job oh, sure. playing Mark Hamill. Sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're 100% right about that. That wasn't Luke Skywalker. That was Mark Hamill. Yeah. Um, I hated that. And the reason for that is because of a, a comment that I made earlier. The thing that I touched on earlier is that Luke Skywalker is King Arthur. In the first Star Wars film, that is exactly the story arc he plays. He plays the literary hero. It's an established trope in literature and in films. Um, it's the paragon of virtue, the person who's always right. That doesn't necessarily make the right decision, but that... That the person that grows from naive, uh, poor farm boy to the great epic hero and is just um, this person who will never be swayed by evil, even if the writers, um, you know, make it seem like he might be. He's the person who will always um, save the friend or save the girl and win the day against all the odds and stuff like that. And that's exactly what happens in the first Star Wars film. And I feel like The Last Jedi, he wasn't that character anymore. And maybe there's supposed to be some backstory about, um... Oh, well, I mean, there's you the know, comic book you were supposed to have read. Right, that I totally read. I didn't read it. I don't even actually know if it exists. Um... <laughs> No, just the, okay, so, like, after all these years, Luke, um, is grown jaded and, you know, is disenchanted by the idea of the Jedi or the idea of the Jedi Order, more specifically, and, you know, is all, he's an old man now and doesn't have all these young man, um, just hopes and dreams and stuff like that. He's seen maybe this gritty reality, but here's, here's my point. So did Obi-Wan. You have to show that. It's the whole yeah. point of the medium. And I was arguing with someone about a movie the other day. Oh, um, this is going to give me a lot of hate. Black Panther. Not a good film. Terrible for this, CGI. For this exact reason. There was so much backstory that they just shoved down your throat without showing you. And the whole point of the... The cinematic medium is to show you things so that you know them. They're, what Disney's done with The Last Jedi is just made you assume that Luke Skywalker has turned into this character without giving any rationale for him turning into this character. You're forgetting the number one rule of filmmaking. Tell, don't show. Yes, correct. Which is exactly the opposite of the number one rule, <laughs> rule of filmmaking. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that was just... That, that was the thing that bothered me the most. It... It, it honestly totally took me out of the immersion of the film. Um, the entire time Luke was on screen, I was yeah, just like... Yeah, was too snarky. This is, yeah, it's, I was like, this is not Luke Skywalker. It's Mark Hamill playing the animated Joker. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're on point there. Yeah, um, it bothered me. That just bothered me so much, and it honestly ruined the movie for me. I know a lot of reviewers have said this, but I completely agree with the statement. Yes. Yes, Luke Skywalker should have faced down the whole uh, First Order with a laser sword. Yeah. But, I mean, he's Luke Skywalker. Like, he's a legend. I get it. They do They do actually do, do a pretty good job of establishing Luke as, like, this once-in-a-generation sort of legend. I mean, like, they kind of do with Anakin in the prequels. Like, they, yeah. he's, like, literally, like, this... He's not even a person anymore. He's a mythical figure. Like, all of The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi establish that um and so yeah it's not necessarily inconceivable to me that the entire first order having never laid eyes on luke skywalker sees one person walking out of this cave and go 
oh, that's Luke Skywalker. Oh my god. He might actually be able to kill us all with just yeah. by himself with a laser sword. Like, they do a pretty good job of establishing that. It was just um, the attitude of his character that bothered me. Well, that's frankly what I was referencing. Because oh. he talks about that. What do you expect me to do? Face down the full first order with right. a laser sword. But anyway. Yeah, that that is the crux of it. Do you want to talk about everyone's favorite scenes? Can't bite. Oh, God. Um fantastic world that they did nothing with it would have been great if they had yeah i thought it would have been great if they had uh they, sh- just sh- had it more in the film if they're talking if they're talking about wanting to do spin-offs and whatnot could you not see like a heist movie oh totally canto by yeah oceans 11 yeah just but like, in the star wars universe yeah yeah it'd be amazing or you know a knockoff of a bond film where you have you know a spy <laughs> go there and casino actually, royale yeah, you could even theoretically do the same two characters, just, you know, make them a little bit more intelligent and reasonable. Right, yeah. Oh my god. And that could have been a whole separate film. I mean, Disney's not milking this cow hard enough. <laughs> oh, is that your opinion? Uh, yes, I will go I will go on <laughs> record. go on record as saying Disney's not milking Star Wars hard enough. All right. Um, there, there, there's some... <laughs> I feel like we've beaten this dead horse enough. Oh no, no. There's a there's a couple more things to go over with the uh the last Jedi. Um the reason I want to say this is because I've heard so many people comment on it but then not go through with it. People comment on Luke's X-wing. They're like, "Oh, they set that up that, you know, he could leave." No. They were setting up that he was stuck there. They like that okay here okay hold on let me let me qualify this by saying that is a total Chekhov's gun yeah it's no 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 actually I would argue that it's not I'm arguing that I don't know uh if Ryan Johnson uh intended this uh or not but I thought that the reason we were shown the x-wing in the state of repair we were shown the x-wing was to prove to us that Luke had no way off that he was stuck there Oh, see, I thought it was totally a callback to when it sinks. In Dagobah, yeah. Yeah, in Dagobah, and he was going to lift it up again. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people were thinking of, but it looked broken and decrepit to me. Like, it looked like it would not work. I guess I'd have to go back and watch it again. I only watched Last Jedi once because I didn't like it. Yeah, it just came out on Blu-ray, and I, uh, I'll all I'll have to go I've back gone... and watch it again and give that scene a good look. Yeah, that, I'm curious about that because just about every reviewer mentions that. Like, oh, they set it up. And I'm like, no, they were setting up that he couldn't leave. Sure. Because you notice things um, in the final scene, or not the final scene, but the uh, scene on the uh, not Hoth planet um, that showed that Luke wasn't actually there. Like, he didn't leave. You noticed at the time that he didn't leave footprints. You noticed right. at the time he was using the wrong lightsaber. And that his uh, hair was uh, more colored. Yeah. I noticed that his hair was more colored, but I also knew he couldn't leave. Like, when I saw him there, I was wondering, how the hell did he get there? And so, I think that that showing of the X-Wing was that trick. It was supposed to tell you, no, he couldn't leave, but it was also supposed to trick you, maybe he could. You know? Sure. Um, Yeah, I didn't think of him having flown the X-Wing there at all. Uh, I was... Because they'd spent a lot of the movie setting up the force projection thing between Rey and Kylo Ren. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, oh yeah, this is obviously that. I yeah, pretty I much got it right off the bat. Um, I kept expecting force bubbles. <laughs> Giant sure. force bubble. Whatever. Anyway, we're done with The Last Jedi. We both think it's the worst Star Wars film. What's next for you? Ooh. The next one up the chain. Uh, honestly... I hate to do this, but The Force Awakens. All right. Now, I will say The Force Awakens is a more enjoyable film to watch than Episode One. But I... Oh, man. I disagree with you on that point, but we'll get to that. But I don't like uh, The Force Awakens as much as I like Episode One. I think Episode One's, you know, a little slower, a little less visually interesting, except for, of course, the pod racing scene um, and the battle uh, with the, uh, the droids. But The Force Awakens itself was... I know this is a popular opinion, and I hate that I have a popular opinion, but whatever. 
Great film, terrible Star Wars film. Yeah, okay, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, so, if you'll allow me, I have The Force Awakens in two places on my list. Ooh. I have it right here where you have it, just above Last Jedi as the second worst Star Wars film. But in terms of uh, the idea that the writers had and the production company had, which was, to me... Um, a soft sea boot? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> uh, it, it was bring in the old audiences by showing them, like the established Star Wars fans, by showing them all the characters they know and love. So Chewie, R2-D2, C-3PO, Han, the Millennium Leia, Falcon. the Millennium Falcon. Show them that. Because that's what established yep. Star Wars fans want to see. And then, because this is a movie company and they're trying to make money, introduce new characters that you could franchise, which right. are R- Faye. Bleh, Faye. Faye. Yeah, I'm calling them Faye. They're a package deal. Finn, Ray, um, BB-8. Tuvok. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the point is, that you yeah, have to bring right. in new characters that you can market for, one, for... Um, <laughs> all the Star Wars collectors who are going to buy new action figures and stuff. And But they haven't been. Well, okay, but that's not that's, that's not, not the that's, point. It's not yeah, relevant. Yeah. It's not relevant because the intention was, was to do that. Yeah. Um and to bring in a new generation of kids who are gonna want all the new Star Wars toys and stuff like Indeed. that. Um in and okay, and then not only are you doing that with the characters, but you are also showing, which is what The Force Awakens was, the greatest hits of Star Wars. I mean they had Literally, they had Death Star Trench Run. Yeah, they had a Death Star Two Millennium Falcon in, in on inside the guts run. Yeah, they had all this stuff right. They were just Tons callbacks. Of swings. Yeah, all of this stuff. They were just callbacks to um, the original Star Wars films because they want to show the established fans um, the things that the established fans want to see, which was which was that. And yeah. in in that sense, um, in the sense of the movie, the sense of the people who are making the movie made exactly the movie they were trying to make. They didn't miss the mark at all. Um, there are a lot of examples of films who, where the, mostly um, mostly these are horror films that don't hit, um, that tend to... Horror films that evolve into slasher films are horror films that missed. Um, those are movies that, that were trying to be scary and only ended up being surprising. And that's how, the t- that's how you tell the difference between like a truly horrifying horror film and just a scary horror film. Um, if you have to use pop scares, jump scares, to scare people... Jump startles, thank you very you, much. You've missed the mark as a horror film. You haven't done it. Yeah. But with The Force Awakens, with what they were trying to, trying to do, namely, show the old characters and establish new characters and show the highlights and establish a new storyline, they did all that. They hit it exactly on the mark and to to me that makes it a good film like that makes it better than mm, revenge of the sith for example uh where all the character all the dialogue is terrible characters are uninteresting um storyline is boring except for the hugely epic lightsaber fight at the end um in that sense like like as a movie as 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 a as just as a cinematic experience, Force Awakens is better than a lot of the Star Wars films. So that's actually an interesting thing. If I had to pick a film to go and see in the theater, it would be a completely different film. But after that film, which will remain nameless for the time being, it would be The Force Awakens. Right. Because it is frankly pretty gorgeous as a standalone film it looks really nice i mean obviously it has the benefit of the technology that we make movies with nowadays but but which previous star wars films didn't have because they do now because that technology is always evolving but um yeah i mean it looked really good it uh it had a it had an okay storyline um i mean there was at least like a plot and there were it -hmm. established characters pretty early on who grew and um you came to care about by the end of the film um in that sense it's a really good movie it's just not a good star wars movie and it's not even that it's not a good star wars film this this is where i do argue my against my own point that it's not a good star wars film if it didn't involve the old characters 
and I really do mean that, if it didn't involve the old characters and was like taking part in a different part of the Star Wars universe, I would be totally okay with it. It's the starting the character assassination that rubs me the wrong way. Sure. Um, that's why I was saying, like, uh, when Disney usurped this, uh, they should have just done a clean break. I know they couldn't have because of all the points you just said. I, I get that they couldn't have. But if you have to stick with the old characters, you have to be more respectful. And I feel even The Force Awakens wasn't respectful to the old characters. Sure. Um, uh, one, one story I've heard, or you know, one of the reoccurring things, is they brought its corpse out to dance for us. <laughs> yeah, you know? well, yeah, I mean, you're not wrong, right? They kind of they did do that. They sort of paraded all these characters in yeah. front of us, and then, uh, sh- you know, said, shove it. You're not in literally the next movie that we're making yeah. or the one after that because now they've killed off everyone except Chewbacca and Carrie Fisher right <laughs> which yeah let's see how that's gonna happen I will say this at the end of Rogue One when they did the CGI thing that actually had Carrie Fisher in it um I really enjoyed that I, I got it that it was like obviously it was CGI and it wasn't really her because that was made after she died um but it was actually made before she died, but she was the point was the youngness, right? Whatever, yeah. Point is, uh, I really appreciated that they did that, and they did it for the other guy who plays, um, Grand Moff Tarkin. Grand Moff Tarkin, yeah. I was... didn't notice Grand Moff Tarkin, I didn't notice that he was CGI, I didn't notice it right away, that's for sure. I what I've like went back and watched like worst of clips of him, and it's obvious when people like point out, like, hey, these are the worst scenes, but beyond that, I mean. Man, he was convincing to me. Right. Um, and so, like, like I kind of appreciated that they did that with that for that one scene in Rogue One. But now you're going to have to make, like, more scenes or with CGI Carrie Fisher. Oh, my God. Okay, so this is the thing. This Ash said the exact same thing to me. She's going to die off camera. The whole point of a movie is to show, not tell. If they're going to kill her off camera, you know what the opening scene of the next movie has to be? Funeral. Funeral. Yeah. It has to be, or else they've messed up. So she's the only one that gets a funeral. Yes. Luke doesn't. Han doesn't. No body, no death. <laughs> no body, no crime. <laughs> yeah. Um, There's no body for Han. He fell down an endless well. There's no body for Luke. He faded into a forest ghost. Off topic here. There's no body for Obi Wan. He faded into a force, force ghost. There's no body for. There is a body for Darth Vader. Vader. They burn it. Yeah, but that's a funeral. Qui Gon. They burn it. Yeah. So Qui Gon, Darth Vader, and Padme get funerals. Yes. There's a lot of funerals. There's three funerals in nine films. Tons of funerals. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that that's a gratuitous amount of funerals. Sure. Actually, there's more than that because there's the uh, the Owens. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they get a funeral, funeral and then there's a, a funeral for um, Anakin's mother. Yeah, Shmi Skywalker. I was yeah. gonna say that one too. And wow, Star Wars is really dark. <laughs> yeah, and yet we don't see blood until the Force Awakens. Yeah, true. Yeah. All right, so next Star Wars film up from the worst. Okay. Third worst Star Wars film. So, at this point in the list, I do have to say, I uh, haven't seen Solo. <gasps> so, uh, you, <gasps> you are not to uh, talk about Solo. Alright, I won't put Solo on my list or talk about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, next up from the... Well, actually, you never told me for sure that The Force Awakens was there. You said you wanted it in two places. Yes, I want it in two places, so I'm okay. putting it there. All right. I'll put it again where I want it. So I've got an extra film on you. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Um, then my next one. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, God. This is actually going to be really hard to say. Episode 5. What? Yeah. Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. The one that's, like, universally, universally regarded as the best, the best one. one. It's yeah. not my favorite. <laughs> um, now... The reason I say that is there are parts of that film that I adore. You know, the the opening is fantastic. 
Um, the stuff with uh, Luke on Dagobah, great. Um, I, you know, the uh, no, I am your father. You know, all that that jazz is is really fantastic. But it, to me, it's like a clip show. Like these are the best parts of this film. I don't like it as a whole. If that makes any sense. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of different locations in it. I guess I can gr- I can give you that. I was debating of putting episode one here, or episode five, and I really have to say it's still a push. I can't decide which goes there. Oh man. Because, like I said, I don't like episode five as a complete film. I do like episode one as a complete film, but I also don't think it's great. <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to use one of Ash's favorite lines here in okay. honor of him and Star Wars and say, um, I respect your opinion. Just, uh, know that you're wrong and I hate you. I mean, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, here is where I am putting Revenge of the Sith. Ooh. Episode three. The best of the prequels. The worst of the prequels. Um, here's why. They rushed it. Oh, yeah. They rushed the storyline. It really feels like that should have been one where it's two parts. It was so necessary to show the growth of Anakin from the chosen one innocent young boy into Darth Vader. And they were too stagnant in episode two. Yep. And then they had to rush that transformation in episode three. Um the the just like the opening scenes where you sh- they show him killing Count Dooku um, was like oh wait a minute where did this come be- come from because that side of him was never really shown in Attack of the Clones yeah yes but it's it's set up at the end of Attack of the Clones yeah it is. again. Show, don't tell. Like, this is the whole... This is my thing with yeah. movies. Like, you, like okay, yes. I'll, I'll give them this. They showed it. They sh- <laughs> they damn well showed that transition. They, you know, that is a truly, like, not Jedi thing to do. Um, some might go far as calling that evil. Um, it's just that uh, I felt like the story was rushed. I felt like, first of all, Hayden Christensen is just not... A good actor <laughs> i mean mm. he's just not look at the look at all the other actors in that fi- in in that film natalie portman who is super ultra megastar ewan mcgregor super ultra megastar ian, ian mcdarmid who has been a su- super mul- ultra megastar for a long long time um hayden christensen just doesn't belong in that company and uh he really takes me out of the film um i just can't uh can't stand his character he totally overacts and and the other thing is that i'll say is that um it's not always the actor's fault there are certainly writers that can be blamed for this um much like sand right yeah writers are coarse and they get everywhere (laughs) uh yeah um i just uh just the whole anakin character bothers me and it bothers me because they rushed it they bothered if if they had taken a longer time to show that transition, I would have understand it. But it just seems like Anakin makes one irrational emotional leap after another um, down into darkness. And those things, to me, aren't the way that humans change their personalities. Like, it, like maybe it's just that they didn't do a good job of showing the time period that this took place over, but it just felt like everything was sort of rushed and coming to a head and, like... Anakin turned completely turned his personality around like overnight. The attempted murder of his wife still makes no sense to me. The fact that he like strangled Padme makes absolutely no sense to me. He is one of the strongest at that point Jedi's around. Well, I guess no. At that point, he's a Sith um, because he already did the whole yeah. So he's one of the most powerful beings in this universe. He could press her up against a wall. He could make her fall to her knees. He doesn't have to choke her. Right, and here's the other thing, is that he's, <laughs> in that same scene, he yells at Obi-Wan, saying, You turned her against me. 
why is he choking Padme? Why is he not choking Obi-Wan? Also, (laughs) I've never understood that. That whole, just that whole thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Immediately after that is one of the most epic scenes in all of the Star Wars universe. That entire lightsaber duel between Anakin and Obi-Wan is amazing. It looks great. It's dramatic. They're just everything about every second of that is exciting you don't think that it drags on too long no god no i wish that was the entire film hour and 20 minutes whatever the runtime was that would have been incredible i would have loved to see that that would have been amazing more lightsaber duels please disney for the love of god well you know plinkett always loves those lightsaber battles (laughs) yeah have you actually watched any of the Plinket reviews? No, oh. of course not. Is it on YouTube? I haven't seen it. Oh, well, it's like only the biggest thing on YouTube. No, when it's it not. Com- well, when it comes to Star Wars, yeah. Maybe. I so. don't know. You would know better than I would. Anyway, point is, <clears throat> episode three. It was in that slot? For third, you? third worst Star Wars film. Okay. Well, then for the next film. I'm still saying either episode 5 or episode 1. Like I said, they're tied, so might as well count them as 2. So let's talk about episode 1. Okay. Just just a little bit. Why do I not like it? Sure. Um, realistically, I rewatched it recently. It was better than I remember. I'm going to actually say that. I felt like it was a little slow at the beginning. I don't think the characters are nearly as one-dimensional as everyone else makes them out to be, as we kind of talked about. I think that people are right, that it doesn't set them up for much growth as much as, you know, uh, Episode 4 did. But again, as you said, Episode 4 was kind of an accident when it came to the setting up for the growth. But I, I really like the world building that takes place in Episode 1. I love the world building. Like... I like that the droids are not just like super intelligent AI robots. They're they're controlled by this ship. I I do love the just the architecture and styling on Naboo. I mean, it, it is so complete. You know what I mean? Like it's clearly alien, but it is so complete. Like the the ships don't look out of place. Their uniforms don't look out of place. It all looks like it is a real place. Uh, kind of the same with the Gungans, like. Not to the, as extent, you know, as um, the Nabooians? The Naboo, I believe is what they're called in the film. Yes, but would the Naboo humanoids be different than the Naboo Gungans? Yeah, because they're the Naboo and the Gungans. Okay, so the Gungans don't uh, get their own planet. Gungans name. referred to... No, because it's a really ham-fisted Manifest Destiny Native American analogy metaphor. That's the word metaphor. Except they have the beauty of not being able to live in each other's environments. Kinda. Right. Kinda. Yeah. The Gungans can clearly live on land. They just don't. But anyway. Um, you're right. The pod, scene, uh, pod racing scene is, I would argue, the third most visually stunning uh, scene in Star Wars. And being one of the most interesting scenes, uh, frankly, more than any of the battles. Um, now... I saw you raise eyebrows at that in terms of the visually stunning thing. I think what I consider the most visually stunning scene in all of Star Wars, you'll go, okay, I can see that, but you won't, like, be that impressed, which is uh, the uh, shadows on the Death Star in Rogue One. Okay. Like, it's just the way that the ships play, you know, with the light, I think is beautiful. But it's not particularly that interesting. I mean, it, they, they hold on it as long as they need to, and then they move on. Right. So, and then, of course, my next one, by the way, would be the uh, hyperspace slice through the ship scene from, oh, from Last, Last Jedi. Jedi. That was pretty sweet. I mean, it's gorgeous looking, if anything else. For a film with such bad CGI... <laughs> It has some pretty good looking scenes. It has some beautiful scenes, but for some reason, I kept noticing the CGI in the Force Awak or the Last Jedi. Sure, I didn't notice it in the Force Awakens. Didn't notice it in any other. Notice in that one. Um, and you gotta really, really respect the creativity with just everything that was done in that. It's this playbook. You know, everyone says, "Oh, they don't set up the characters." Sure, they don't set up the characters as well as other films, but man, do they set up the world. Yeah. 
I agree with that. They totally world built the heck out of it, yeah. which is one of my favorite. I mean, particularly in in um, in a literary sense, like world building is super important to me. Um, but yeah, for sure, they built the world really. They spent a a really long time. I mean, they established Naboo really well. Obviously, that's like where most of the thing takes place. But like, and they Chris stepped. That, yeah, they, they established Coruscant really well, because um, Coruscant's really important in the next two films. Like, like um, yep. yeah, I, I, I agree with you that the world building in episode one was really good. Um, I'm not putting episode one in this slot. Ooh. I'm putting episode two in this slot. Fair enough, but predictable. Right. Um, there's a pattern emerging. <laughs> Uh, yeah, episode two was, again, just okay. Um, but I have the exact opposite problem with episode two that I had with episode one. Um, and you, or not episode one, episode three. Um, and you have to find a happy medium between these two things. I didn't like episode three because it was rushed. I didn't like episode two because it was stagnant. There's no growth at all on the characters. And that's like, that's... Growth in characters doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's unimportant in storytelling. Um, that was that's the thing I felt it was just like okay, so so uh, it's been however many years since episode one, and all this stuff has happened off screen, and like they're grown up, and there's this big war going on, and all this stuff. Um, How long is it? Is it like eight or ten years? I don't know, but it's old enough for them to need a different actor. So Ooh. yeah, and then like I don't know, man, just the whole thing, like Anakin just. Anakin just bugs me. Hayden Christensen just bothers me. God dang it. He that really poor does. Guy. I know, I know. And I've seen other, you know, the thing is, I've seen other Hayden Christensen films where he was, like, kind of okay. Um, like, wasn't, he wasn't, wasn't terrible, but, like. He was in a film with Nicolas Cage where they played Knights Templars fighting in China against Genghis Khan. Yeah, that totally happened. That was good. <laughs> sure. Um, I've seen him in other films and he was, you know, he's good. Or at least not terrible. Um, just in the Star Wars movies really bothers me. And uh, yeah, so that whole thing, like, dude, I just I saw the 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 romance with Padme coming from a mile away. Like that was so obvious. I've well, like, been setting that up since episode oh, one. Oh, please, at least make it like a love triangle with Obi Wan in there, or something like that. Obi Wan's like, noble. I don't care. It's not the point. It's good storytelling. Patrick. Who cares about the story? Yeah, exactly. They clearly didn't. George Lucas doesn't care about the story because I mean, he ruined Star Wars. These are historic documentaries because, I mean, these events happened, happened a long, long time, long time ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Um, so just because we want an interesting story doesn't mean history was interesting. I literally have no other problem with, with episode two other than the fact that, like, there was no character growth. Was there, though? I didn't think so. Not enough. Seriously. Yeah. Okay, so this is where I'm going to reveal you my can, okay. ignorance. Uh, establishing a love story doesn't establish character growth if nope. the characters stay the same. I'm talking about um, in episode two, and this is where I'm going to like show I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, in episode two, does not Anakin go from being... You know, kind of a cocky guy. To at the end, doesn't he murder a bunch of sand people? Uh, I don't. Okay, was that episode three? I don't think he's cocky at all, and I think that's part of the problem. I don't think he's. I don't think he's cocky at all in the sense of like, like the first couple scenes when like when he sees Padme again, right? And he's like super shy, uh, and is oh, like yeah. kind of awkward and weird. Like, that's the exact opposite of cocky for me. Like, he might be cocky in... Uh, he's de he's way more cocky in the beginning of episode three when they're, like, flying the Jedi starfighters through the battlefield. Yeah. And then he's, like, he's like making all these glib comments to Obi-Wan about, like, well, I saved your butt again or whatever. I don't remember the exact line that he says. Um, stuff like, like that, to me, is cocky Anakin. I don't think Anakin's cocky at all in episode two. See, I mean, when he murders sand people, when he murders the sand people, it's like one thing. It's like uh, what film was that in, though? I'm gonna let you look it up. I, I'm I am looking it <laughs> up, but uh, that um, 
That tells you great things about these films, by the way. We have both watched yeah, seen these them films. a ton of times and couldn't tell you what scene yeah. it's from. It's yeah, it's another issue with the films. Um, Dead air. It's always the best thing. Yeah, I know, right? No, now I'm trying to think. I don't think that show again. Uh, I don't think that shows character growth though. That doesn't. Um, that doesn't really change anything you knew about Anakin. Uh, yes, it he's, does. He's always no, it doesn't. He's always been hot headed. No, it doesn't change your opinion of him. But if you had not seen four, five, six, you don't know that he's Darth Vader. You see him become evil. I don't. No, that's not evil. Okay, they do a really good job of establishing the fact that Anakin is hot headed. That's a thing that happens very early on in episode two, and they keep showing it again and again and again that he's impulsive, um, that he doesn't listen. That uh, they're they're setting him up to become this person that breaks away from br- breaks away from the Jedi Order and doesn't listen to Obi Wan when Obi Wan tells him to do things. But the the impulsiveness and the hot headedness and the not listening to the Jedi that makes so much sense to me. They do a really good job in Episode One of setting up how much he cares about his mother because he like that's like a really emotional scene when he weaves and all this stuff and. Um, like, he keeps asking about her and stuff like that. He, they do this whole thing where he sets out on this huge journey with Padme to find his mother. and goes through all this stuff, and, like, that drags on forever. That was another thing I didn't like about the movie. Like, uh, they just... Those scenes lasted too long. Um, then he founds out she died, and uh, I think it's totally Anakin. I think they've done a really good job of establishing the entire movie up to that point of Anakin um, going to kill the people, kill all the kill all the sand people because then what they do is they turn around and show how anguished he is over doing that which i didn't take that as anguish he's yeah of course he is he's like crying while he says it yeah but i don't think he's crying so the impression i got from that and by the way yes this does take place in episode two that's what i thought um what i got from that scene was not that he was upset about taking lives but more that he was upset that he was breaking his Jedi vows. Again, it's this; those two things are the same thing. It's anguish. He's mm. he he broke his Jedi vows by doing the th- by taking lot by killing the Sand People who were not necessarily innocent, but some of but, them were, and that he points that out. Right, exactly. But the point is that he's anguished about it. He he feels remorse for this thing that he's done. The reasoning by behind him feeling divorced, we can talk about all day. Fact is he feels remorse. And that is I think is that's established. I think that's pretty much right in his character's wheelhouse. I don't think that changes anything that that Anakin was before. Um I disagree. That's fine. That's why I mean, we're having yeah. this conversation. That's why we put those movies in different places on the list. As a whole, as a whole, like watching the uh, the pre tridge. Um, I'm not got, calling it that. The ridge tridge works, but I, yeah. yeah, there's nothing about that that works. Um, when you look at it a whole, yeah, you're 100 percent right. But I'm talking about I'm trying, I'm trying to give the filmmakers the benefit of the doubt. Oh, see, and, that's the one thing I never do. Never give filmmakers the benefit of the doubt. And you just. There, there's a lot of stuff missing, as you say, you know, between each episode. And it does feel like a natural progression to me. If anything, if anything, uh, Anakin hesitating to kill Dooku at the beginning of episode three is a step backwards. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, because he hesitates. But the fact is that he does it. Yeah. And like that... The thing is, the thing is about episode three is the sense that like, um, like, they show him doing that at the very beginning, and then he becomes Darth Vader at the end. But like, I just like, I don't have a problem with them showing him doing that at the beginning of the movie. Movie. I just think that they should have taken a longer time period to show the progression all the way to Darth Vader. I felt like it was too rushed. But no, you're you're totally right. Episode three is too rushed. Yeah. A hundred percent. But I still do see the development as the three parts go on. All right, what's next for you? Well, okay, so we got episode one out of the way. Ooh. 
that this is now another uh, versus between an Eridritridge episode and one of the prequels. But I'm going to have to give it to episode three. I, uh, as much as I do love episode three, I will admit I like it for its visual spectacle. I hate that it's rushed. You're, you're right. I would love to see General Grievous uh, fleshed out more. Because I knew him from the Clone War series. And he was one of my favorite characters. Because, like, frankly, he was kind of a, a different sort of villain. He wasn't so stoic. He wasn't so controlled. Um, he had weird obsessions and whatnot. He was a deeper villain. He wasn't as frightening of a villain as, like, say, Darth Vader or Darth Maul. But he just seemed like a more complicated character. And plus, I mean, what, what kid doesn't like four lightsabers? I mean, you know, bump it up from two, four. Um, I'm also mildly partial to episode three because I saw it in theaters, opening night, the time it premiered. It was the only Star Wars film I did that for. Um, had to get tickets way in advance. They showed some other film for like 20 minutes by accident until like someone noticed <laughs> it was bad um kind of an off note there were a ton of women there in dresses made from star wars bed sheets which i just thought was interesting and needed to point that out but yeah episode three i would put there uh mostly i do have to admit the cgi doesn't hold up all the time in that film lots of blue screens that were unnecessary mostly what you've said is why i put it there it's to me it's above a lot of other films but it's it's not that great um yeah i mean there's nothing else i can say about episode three that i haven't already said i'm putting episode one in this slot okay um and uh i feel like we've talked a lot about episode one too but i just really like it i think the pod scene the pod racing scene is amazing um I really liked Liam Neeson as Qui-Gon Jinn. Um, I really liked Darth Maul as just like visually as a villain. I really liked uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I loved the reveal when um, Padme's not Padme, but then she is. Uh, her Also happens in episode three. Right, yeah. <laughs> they just, which they totally used again. Um, I... Loved every scene that had Gungans in it. I know a lot of people hate Jar Jar Binks. I thought he was hilarious when I was seven. Um, Which is what he was meant for. Right. Uh, I thought it was great. I loved that the battle scene on Naboo simultaneously happening with the battle scene in space. When Anakin goes in the, goes in the Naboo Starfighter. Um, I really... I just... There's nothing about the film I don't like. Then why is it so low? Because I like the other ones better. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And I would actually make that same statement about episode three. Actually. It's probably one of the films that I go back to the most in terms of throwing something on in the background. I wouldn't sit down and watch episode three, I, but it's great to have. I it. would sit down and enjoy watching episode one again. Okay. Yeah. I would, like I said, I watched the pod racing scene with my dad on Sunday morning. Fair enough. It's so good. Um, next one for you. Uh, Revenge of the Jedi. <laughs> Revenge of the Jedi? Oh, come on. You gotta know that reference. No. Oh, that was Did the... Did it come from the internet? Then I don't know it. That's the original title of uh, Return of the Jedi. Oh. But then George Lucas got wind of that they were going to use that, and he goes, but Jedis aren't vengeful. Mm. And hence, Revenge of the Sith, which is why yeah. that's titled that. Um, and actually, there were some posters made up that said Revenge of the Jedi. Before they change the name. Be cool to find. They're hugely valuable. Return of the Jedi. Yeah. So, uh, I really love the interplay between Luke and Darth Vader. I, for some reason, when I was a kid, just totally could care less about Palpatine. Big whoop. I actually really do feel like the prequels make Palpatine far more important now. Um, like, I know a lot of people say that in the Ridge Tridge, the, uh, that Palpatine is the big, you know, bad guy, and Darth Vader is his, you know, henchman. Which is true, which is true. But as a kid watching these films, Darth Vader's clearly the one in control. You know, yeah, the Palpatine's pulling the strings, but it's only because Darth Vader's letting him, you know, sort of thing. Right. At least that's the appearance as a kid. 
But then when you go back and you watch the prequels, the prequels was supposed to be Anakin's story, but it doesn't really end up being that. It really does end up being the story of Palpatine. Um, sure, Anakin has his arc, but Palpatine is the one that is constantly doing things and is, frankly, improving his character. So, yeah, the interplay between uh, Luke and his father is a big deal to me as a kid, and then now as an adult, the interplay with the uh, w- with the Emperor is a big deal. Um not gonna lie mildly like the ewoks not in the sense that i think they're cute in fact i actually think they're horrifying <laughs> um they're they're, they're the, adorable what are you talking about? their little bitty mouths are frightening as all get out they're so cool they are nightmares incarnate <laughs> and the porg are infinitely better oh well we can fight in the parking lot after the show about that <clears throat> um that being said even though they decided on a terrifying um art design for the little ewoks uh i do like the way they talk i like the way they interact with things you know yep yep (laughs) and uh all that jazz um i love the fleshing out of the ground vehicles you know sure we got to see the uh the walkers in previous films but i love that there's like you know, ATAT bases. Yeah. You know, uh, that was a pretty cool concept. Uh, I do love the, the the switch. You know, of this is a fully armed and operational battle station. Now, that's actually a point I want to bring up at this point. The Ridge Tridge doesn't have as many quotable moments as the prequels. Yeah, I agree with that. Which is interesting to me. There's definitely quotes. But they're not, like, useful quotes that you can use in everyday life. Like, I bet you if you're, you know, a youngin, when you're playing video games, I'm sure you yelled at one of your friends at some point, I have to high, you cannot win, I have to high ground. Of course. It's, like, literally one of the most popular memes currently on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, try spinning. That's a good trick. Right, that's a good trick. Is useful. Not very useful, but useful. And then, of course, everyone does love dropping the I hate sand right. in the line. But uh, I like that aspect of it. Um, and that's more or less it. You know, okay. I don't particularly care for the battle scenes in it. I mean, they're cool, whatever. But the interplay between Luke and Darth Vader is just huge. Um, so since I'm ranking Force Awakens twice and therefore have an extra film than you, I'm going to do, put two films back to back right now. Okay. One of them being Force Awakens. This is where I think Force Awakens should go as far as, like, it's worth it as a complete standalone film in the sense that the filmmakers did what they were trying to do. That's This is where it goes. Okay. Um, then the next one I'm going to say is um, Rogue One. Okay. Is in this slot for me. Um, and uh, we haven't talked a lot about Rogue One, but... Um, well, there's a reason for that. Right. Uh, <laughs> I really, really, really liked Rogue One. I, in fact, I'd go so far as to say I loved Rogue One. I think Rogue One is the best of the rebooted franchise. Um, better than Solo, better than Last Jedi, better than Force Awakens. Um, almost entirely because it didn't have any of the established characters in it yep i really liked seeing the extended universe on screen i really enjoyed seeing this entirely separate story that exists in the same universe that's one of my favorite things that happens in book series fantasy especially like epic fantasy series where authors will write like novellas and stuff that's what this felt like to me like novellas that are in universe that like uh is there's a world that's built that you that's been established that you understand um that you just plug new characters in or new perspectives into and that's what i liked so much about rogue one also i thought the story was pretty good i thought um they did a good job establishing the characters early on as sympathetic you rooted you definitely rooted for these certain characters that had their particular quirks um it's, there was a good climax. It's fantastic that they brought George Lucas back to do, yeah. redo the sequel. Spoiler alert, everybody died at the end, just like Toy Story 3. Um, I loved Scarif. That looked so oh, cool. Yeah. It looked so good. Yeah. 
Um, I like that they made the tie the tie reaper a thing in the X Wing miniatures <laughs> tabletop game. Of course, because you I did. bought one and it's so good. Um, I loved the whole because I've been hearing about Saw Gerrera for like a long time because Ash read the books and stuff that he was established in, and like I loved seeing that on screen and like the U Wing and like the you know Saw's Renegades and all that stuff. Um, I liked everything about Rogue One. I don't have I don't have one bad thing to say about Rogue One. Cool. Yeah. So the next film. Next film for me is Return of the Jedi. All right. Um, which we just talked about, so I don't need to say anything else about it. Um, it's just the epic conclusion to an epic trilogy. So I'm going to put it at this place. A New Hope. Okay. Yeah. Um, perfect standalone film. Um, yeah. There's a couple in the Star Wars universe, but th- this one's a perfect standalone film because, again, it was intended to be. Uh, the The mystery that's in it is fantastic. Even if you've seen the other Star Wars films, the way they introduce the world, the way they introduce the characters is still cool. You know, um, I mean, everything that can be said on it has been said about how sure. great it is. There's a lot of little funny things that people, you know, didn't notice at the time, but have since noticed and been exaggerated. Um, the, just the the fact that George Lucas was able to kind of craft this amazing world, it goes back to what we were talking about with uh, episode one, world building. Um, how many of those scenes from that are now used in other things? And I'm not necessarily saying George Lucas came up with all these concepts himself. You know, I mean, right. a lot of it does come from the, the earlier serials and whatnot, but just the way he put it together and the way he brought it to the limelight is just fantastic. I'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay. Um, so what's your number two? My number two is Empire Strikes Back. All right. Yeah. Um, so since I didn't particularly like it that much, tell me about it. And it's the, again, it's not that I didn't like it. Just... It's the perfect sequel. Um, even the title uh, just conveys exactly what the movie was trying to do. At the at the end of um, at the end of A New Hope, you think, "Wow, the good guys won. The bad guys lost." Um, all is right in the world. There's a happy ending to this story. And then you hear the words, the Empire Strikes Back. And that is exactly what happens in the film. It goes from happy celebration, the Empire was defeated, to, oh wait, the Empire is going to hit you back a lot harder than they just hit, than you just hit them. Um... I think every step of the way in Empire Strikes Back just shows how much of a miracle it was that they won the first time. Um, You just get the sense of the, the Empire is inevitable. They have all the resources. They have all the money. All the power. And every scene in Empire Strikes Back hammers that home where the rebels have this secret base on hoth and it gets discovered because the empire has endless resources and can search out the farthest corners of the galaxy to find the rebels and then commit all these military resources to destroying that one single thing that they found and the rebels are powerless to stop it all they can do is run away um um luke having all these really dark, depressing scenes on Dagobah where, you know, he confronts Darth Vader and it shows his face when he cuts off his head and all this stuff. Um, just how much how much psychologically they were in his head. Um, ev- just everything about... Everything about Empire Strikes Back just says, oh, uh, it was happy, it was on this high, now it's going down, and we are setting you up for... A truly epic conclusion to what was already an epic story. That's what does it with Empire Strikes Back for me. That's it. It's the point where it 
it takes away the hope and the good guys aren't winning. Han Solo gets trapped in, you know, carbonite. Um, it, it like all of that to me is just like, uh, um, Luke getting his hand cut off. Um, all, you know, uh, everything about that is just like, Oh, wait a minute. There's a lot more to this than we first thought. The empire is like truly this, this, uh, um, undefeatable evil that exists in this universe they're not all on the death star right yeah like that's because that's kind of implied in in a new in a new hope is that like the entirety of the empire is run from the death from the death star and that is not the case at all not even close and they they really hammer that home in in empire strikes back that's what does it for me as a film um it i think it, it perfectly sets up return of the jedi um, You're correct. While perfectly picking up from A New Hope, which was meant to be a standalone, which was supposed to be a movie that started and ended where yeah, it that did. is rough. That has to be a rough position to be in to pick up from right. A you sort you've sort of you sort of written yourself into a hole, yeah. and you have to write yourself out of it. And I think George Lucas did that. I really do. I think yeah, it was uh, pretty good. I think Empire Strikes Back did did that really really well, better than maybe any other sequel I've seen. Quotable lines. Sure. Yeah, quite a few of them. <clears throat> what's the temperature of the inside of a tauntaun <laughs> lukewarm <laughs> okay if we're gonna pull out jokes i'm gonna pull out jokes i'm gonna go completely off topic here why do you always bring a spare pair of socks when you go golfing why in case you get a hole in one god dang it okay um fair enough pray i don't alter the deal any further sure good one Oh, also that scene is super badass. Like, yes. door opens, Darth Vader standing there, Han Solo, quick draw, boom, 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 sh- pops off all these shots, and Darth Vader just hand, just no. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. So cool. Two more quotes from the film that are pretty usable. Hmm? I don't know what two quotes you're talking about. I'm, I could think of a bunch. Okay. Well, I mean, there's the obvious one. Hit me. No. Oh, yeah. No, I am, I am your father. father. Whatever. Not not particularly usable, but, you know. Right. Pray I don't alter the deal any further gets used. Um, I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, but that's I mean, it. literally anything that comes out of Yoda's mouth. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that is one of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. Do or do not, there is no try. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so we're, we're starting to pull out some decent quotes from the original Tridge. Yeah. We just don't use them enough. Yeah. All right, number one famous favorite Star Wars film. Well, we can already go. kind of tell where both of us are going yeah, here. Obviously, <laughs> if, you, um, if you've been keeping up, you know what we're going to say. Rogue One. Yeah, not surprised. Um, I think it's a perfect standalone film. Um, I agree. As you know, as typical. Uh, but there's so much about it that I particularly adore. Uh, I love the humor. I, I love K2SO. I, I know he was put in there like Jar Jar, but I, I don't care. I, I really love his dry sense of humor. I love that, frankly, it shows the Rebels as evil. In, like, every situation that the Rebels are doing something in, except for the very beginning scene... The rebels are the people clearly at fault. Right, they're the doing, terrorists. Yeah, doing awful things. Um, there's like scenes where the stormtroopers are like trying to give them help because they don't understand that these are people are terrorists, and they kill them. There's uh, so much joy that these people take in the death of the stormtroopers who are just doing their jobs, which I found fascinating that. Um, that disney was willing to put now I, I assume frankly that a lot of people just thought oh they're stormtroopers they're not really human but i mean we've already been setting up like finn is human other stormtroopers have feelings thoughts cares so setting that up and then having the payoff be the rebels don't care at all that they're the the rebel scum as the empire is so willing to call them uh, doesn't care about the Empire as much as the Empire doesn't care about them. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, as you said, Scarif is just gorgeous. It was really cool. I love that they set up some kind of unique characters. I love that there was like a non-Jedi Jedi 
you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to say something mildly controversial. Um, I think the lead in this film is how you do a strong female character right. Um, unlike certain other Star Wars films? Under like, unlike certain other Star Wars films. Because, uh, you know, frankly, she's just an awesome character and, you know, nothing else matters about that. Uh, I literally think it has three flaws in the whole film. Uh, one, cutting out that line about I rebel. Sorry, great line. Corny should have been in the film. Uh, two, uh, having the uh, TIE fighter standoff at the top of the uh, tower would have been cool. Just saying. And then I'm going to say something very controversial. The film could have been to me perfect if they changed this one thing. Have the character survive. Now, I get it. I get it that having the characters die, big deal. Woohoo. Congratulations on being different. I want my space fantasy happy. I want my heroes to win, and I want my heroes to go home at the end of the day and enjoy their lives. They did win. They did win, but that was it. Okay. Um, I like my space fantasy gritty and dark, and I loved the fact that no one lived. Oh, God. Mommy, Daddy, why did the funny robot just die? (laughs) Um, Alright, so my, obviously, number one favorite Star Wars film is A New Hope, and or just Star Wars. Um, It's pretty obvious. My film tastes go pretty much in reverse order that they were released, with the exception of flipping Force Awakens and Rogue One. Um, (coughs) I, uh, I've always said the joke that my favorite Star Wars films are the order in their release. People ask me what my favorite Star Wars films are, and I say that it's just the order they were released in. Like, four, five, six, one, two, three. For me, that was the longest, I said that for the longest time. Um, A New Hope is the perfect hero story. It is, because it's the trope, it's, it's the King Arthur Sword in the storm, sword in the stone. But it did it right. Story right. Um. Yeah. I, when I when I say it's a trope, I don't mean I don't mean to say that. Um. To, to detract from it. Um. The, there's a reason that story is a trope, and it's because it's the perfect story. It has it has all the elements. It has all the characters of what people want to hear, and that's why we keep we as a human society keep telling that story over and over and over and over. It's because it's perfect. Um. Hero of a thousand faces. Right. That's that's exactly what it that's who Luke Skywalker is. Um he's he's the paragon of virtue who can do no wrong. Um Um Alec Guinness as Alec Guinness is an amazing actor in every movie he's ever been in. Bridge on the River Kwai is one of the very earliest my introductions to um film and he's fantastic in it. Um but Obi Wan Kenobi as the the, the Merlin character, the elder character who, befri- who befriends the young character and knows that he doesn't really have it in him to go on this one last adventure, but does it anyway to, to teach the young, to impart his wisdom onto the young hero. Um, the, the, uh, the Han Solo character, the, the rough and tumble, the Lancelot who, um, you know, is there for the, is there for the physical presence and to, to disillusion the young character from his uh, his happy-go-lucky, hopeful worldview, but then also reinforce it at the same time because he doesn't want to turn into the the disgruntled um, guy who could have been the hero if if some things had been different. I love that. I love all the sidekick characters: Chewie, C three PO, R two D two. Um, the they have they have a princess in it, but not a princess who's who's um, you know, helpless or hopeless, a, a princess who has a character, a female character who has depth, who's intelligent, who stands up to um, the injustices that she sees going on around her. Um, this is, this, another, <laughs> you know, what's funny is I'm going to draw a really weird parallel here, but uh, Shrek has the same character. Princess Fiona is Princess Leia. They are the exact same character in the sense of just being a strong female personality who doesn't put up with the BS that's going on around her and and can and can hold her own and and knows that she can hold her own and yet allows herself to be caught up in um this, you know, this rescue attempt because obviously she wants to be out of there and she's not going to but she's not so full of herself as to think she can get out of it by herself. She's willing to accept help, but not willing to 
be carried. Um, I yeah. guess that's the point. Um, Darth Vader, literally the perfect villain, maybe the best villain of all time in that nope. in that movie. No, please. No, that I I have a uh, a favorite villain, and I will not let you make that argument. But that's another show. Okay, fine. Darth Vader's the greatest villain of all time. Um, uh, who's just overwhelmingly powerful and mysterious and and um, just uh, menacing. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing with the Death Star and blowing up the planets and the the countdown at the end where they're like coming around the they're coming around Endor Yavin whatever is, what is it Yavin it's Endor in the third in yeah, Return of the Jedi four. yeah yeah Yavin um, just uh, all of that the Death Star trench run and the the and first the, the first thing with the yeah just Alec Guinness's voice as the Force Ghost you trust you know use the Force. Um, that whole thing, uh, um, God, I could just wax poetic endlessly about A New Hope. It's not not only my favorite Star Wars movie, but it might be my favorite movie of all time. That is a bold statement. Yeah. I've seen a lot of movies. That's, Ooh. God, that's up there. I'd say... I'm... Can you really have a favorite movie, though? Yeah. Really? I've got three. I was gonna say I would argue that I have like a small hand. I've got a top three, and depending on my mood, they they rotate. Yeah, I can see that. Can see um, that. But yeah, I just like of course anybody who knows me knows that A New Hope is my favorite Star Wars film. It's just perfect. Indeed, I I would argue that indeed it is the perfect Star Wars film. Yeah. But I do again, like I said, like Rogue One is an independent thing too. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, so, that's the other yeah. thing, is that it stands alone, and that it world built so well, and that, um, like... Rogue it, One does not ro- ro- world build very well, though, but yeah, New Hope does. But it, yeah, um, it, it, it just stands, it doesn't need anything else. It yeah. doesn't need any of the sequels to flesh it out, to finish the story. It's just, uh, it's done. At the end of A New Hope, it's just done. It's the, the story's ended. There was a happy ending. Great. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, that's it. That's all I've got to say. So we've been going for an hour and 48 minutes now. I think we're probably done. I think it's good uh, to call it a night at this point. Yeah. So, dear listeners, at this point I would like to remind you, uh, spoiler alert, for the last uh, almost two hours. Uh, if you haven't seen the Star Wars films, I, I apologize. Don't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favorite Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy gags. Uh, at the end of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio series, they say, uh, you know, the, the the proceeding contains all this violence, gore, da 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 da. da. Uh, time traveling may, beings may not wish to view the past three hours. Anyway, so dear listeners, until you join us again, see you out there. <laughs>